The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this lecture on nonlinear finite element analysis of solids and structures. In this lecture, I'd like to continue with our discussion of inelastic material descriptions we use in finite element analysis. Particularly, I'd like to now discuss with you creep, creep of materials. We considered already in the earlier lecture that a typical creep law used in engineering practice very widely is the power creep law, shown here. Here we plot creep strains as a function of time, and curves that we would typically obtain using this creep law for constant stress values with time are shown here. Notice that as, of course, the stress value increases, which however is constant in time, we obtain a larger creep value. The creep strains increase, the creep strains increase, in other words, as the stress increases, clearly shown also by this law. Notice A1 and A2, of course, and A0 are constants that are determined from laboratory test results. There are a number of other creep laws. Two are listed here, one here shown, and another one shown here. Notice in this one here, the temperature, which affects creep strains quite heavily, enters explicitly right here. Uh, in the other creep laws, the first two ones, the one that you saw on the earlier view graph, and this one, these constants, of course, A0, A1, A2, and so on, would depend on the temperature. And if the temperature is constant, you would simply select them depending on that temperature condition and model creep strains this way. However, as I pointed out, here temperature enters explicitly. We will not discuss these creep laws further. The numerical computations with these creep laws are very similar to the numerical computations that we perform when using the power creep law. So I will now use the power creep law as an example to discuss. Um, the creep strain formula, given here once again, cannot directly be applied to varying stress situations because the stress history does not enter directly into the formula. Uh, let us look at that uh, much closer. Here we have a very simplified example where we start off with a certain stress level and then that stress level drops down to this stress level. Notice that if we were to apply the formula sort of blindly, blindly in quotes, we would obtain creep strains that vary depending on this stress level as shown here. And then we might say suddenly the creep strain would drop down and we would carry on going on this curve here. The creep curve, creep strain curve, that corresponds to this stress level. Now this is really quite unrealistic that suddenly when our stresses decrease, the creep strains decrease. Creep strains are accumulated along this curve here and they should certainly be staying right here and the ensuing creep strains should of course now depend on the curve in which sigma 1 enters but we should not see the sudden decrease in creep strain and we need to introduce the concept of strain hardening, the assumption of strain hardening and this says the following, the material creep behavior depends only on the current stress level and the accumulated total creep strain. And we establish the ensuing creep strain by solving for an effective time. Let's look at that closely. Here we have that at a particular time, the creep strain is given via this formula. Now, if we know the creep strain corresponding to a particular time, then we can, we of course know the stress as well, and we know these constants, then we can solve for what is called here an effective time. This effective time 
is not a physical time. It's a time that is simply used for the numerical solution. So we solve for this t bar. And then, knowing this t bar, we can proceed uh, with the creep calculations at a different stress level. Let's look uh, how we would use that t bar first. We would enter here now in this equation. Knowing t bar, simply substitute into here in terms, in terms of the creep strain that we are given from the previous uh, history. And we now get a new creep strain rate. This is how we do the actual computations. Let's look at what this means pictorially. Pictorially, we now look again at the situation where we have a certain stress value. And that stress value drops down, say, to here with time. As long as we are having this stress, our creep, accumulates, creep strain accumulates as shown here. As soon as the stress drops down, we are going over to this curve. So there is no sudden decrease in creep strain, say down here, down to here, and then increasing creep strain the way we looked at it earlier. Instead, we, continues, we continuously increase the creep strain. Let's look at how do we get this curve here. Well, we talked about the evaluation of t bar. t bar is an effective time. With this creep strain given, at the end of, or at the time that this stress value drops down to here, with this creep strain value given, we enter into the formula corresponding to this creep strain accumulation and calculate t bar. t bar, the effective time, would be this value right here. We use now this formula, shown by this black line here, to calculate the corresponding increase in creep strain corresponding to this level of stress. This means that if I draw a little triangle in here, that this line here, for example, is equal to that line. And this slope, or this distance here, is equal to that distance. In other words, I can mark this as, say, A and B. And I have here A and B as well. So basically, we are translating this curve here to right there. And that is shown by these blue arrows. Notice all of this is achieved by the evaluation of the effective time, the effective time corresponding to this creep strain. And this effective time is applied to the creep strain accumulation formula corresponding to this sigma 1 stress level. Well, the increase in stress is modeled similarly. Here we have uh, initially stress sigma 1 and suddenly an increase to sigma 2 level. We would follow this curve here corresponding to sigma 1. And now the increase is increase in stress is captured by solving for the effective time. Using this level of creep strain, we enter into the curve shown here in black to obtain the effective time corresponding to this curve here. This is the curve, of course, corresponding to this sigma 2 level. And we translate these points over as shown by the blue arrows, to obtain this material response curve. So we are now using the effective time again to evaluate the ensuing creep strain when we are going from sigma 1 stress level to sigma 2 stress level. If we have cyclic conditions, we proceed similarly. Here, we have first sigma 1, and then a stress reversal to sigma 2. Notice sigma 1 brings us along this curve. 
And at this particular time, we now reverse the stress. And here we have to be careful to recognize that this curve here, which I'm showing now in green, corresponds to that curve there. In other words, what I'm going, what I, as I proceed along this curve here, I would proceed along that curve there. The reversal in stress is picked up by saying that the accumulated creep strain in one direction corresponding to sigma 1 tensile stress is, so to say, forgotten. And you simply take this curve here to be the reflection of that curve. So this is the condition or the modeling of cyclic loading conditions uh, as regards to creep strains. Of course, these were now the one-dimensional uh, situations. And in a multi-axial stress state, we have to generalize these, sit these considerations to the multi-axial uh, conditions. Let's look at the multi-axial creep, uh, how we proceed there. Here we have the stress at time t plus delta t is equal to the stress at time t plus an integration of the stress strain law times the elastic strain here, differential elastic strain increment. This is the elastic the stress strain law uh, from time t to time t plus delta t. Uh, if the, this matrix is constant, we, call, we can, of course, pull it outside the integration sign. The uh, stress-strain integration is performed uh, for the multi-axial stress state using the concepts that we discussed for the uni-axial stress state and generalizing them to the multi-axial stress states. We define for this purpose an effective stress shown here. These are deviatoric stresses that we already encountered in uh, the discussion of plasticity. An effective strain as shown here. And we use now these two quantities in this material law, the power material law. We only consider now uh, the situation of uh, stresses monotonically increasing or being constant. We do not go into depths regarding cyclic loading conditions. Uh, because we don't have really uh, time to do so. The assumption that the creep strain rates are proportional to the current deviatoric stresses is giving this equation. And that equation is very similar to what we have seen in von Mises plasticity, where gamma is given down here. Notice that the effective creep strain rate is given via this formula where the effective time goes in here. This is the effective time calculated much the same way, well, calculated in the way that I um, discussed earlier for the uniaxial conditions, if, except that we have to now deal with the effective stress here in the effective quantities on the creep strain as well. In other words, we calculate this effective time just the same way as we did it in uniaxial conditions, but always using effective stress and effective uh, strain quantities. Using matrix notation, we can then write that the creep strain increment, the differential creep strain increment, is given via this right-hand side. D is an operator, shown here, for 3D analysis. That gives us the deviatoric stresses from the actual stresses. In the analysis of creep problems, we perform a time integration and this time integration can be difficult due to the high exponent on the stress. Uh, in fact, solution instabilities arise if we, for example, use the Euler forward integration with too large a time step. A rule of thumb is given here where we want to allow only that the effective creep strain increment is smaller or equal to 1 tenth of the effective of the current at time t effective elastic strain. This is a very good rule of thumb. However, it can be conservative. Uh, in some cases, you can really increase this coefficient quite a bit. Alternatively, we can use implicit integration, in which 
when we use the alpha method, we use this formula here. And we would use an implicit integration, typically alpha greater equal to 1 half. Uh, alpha can, in this formula, vary between 0 and 1. Of course, when alpha is equal to 0, we simply have the Euler forward method. Let's look at how we would use this uh, formula when alpha is greater or equal to 1 half. We would calculate the stresses corresponding to the i minus first iteration. And here we have to pause a minute to remember, to recall that this i minus first iteration is the iteration that we have been talking about in earlier lectures when we iterate for the equilibrium of r equal f. Or we are evaluating in each iteration delta, sorry, k times delta u is equal to delta r. And the delta u carries the i superscript, and the delta r carries the i minus 1 superscript. Remember, we talked about the iteration for nodal point equilibrium of external forces with nodal point forces that are corresponding to the internal element stresses. That i minus 1 up here refers to that iteration. This k down here refers to the iteration that is in addition necessary at each integration point level due to the fact that we use an implicit scheme. Well, this left-hand side is calculated by taking the stress at time t, which we know already, and adding to it an increment in stress obtained via the elastic material law here. The total strain increment from time t to time t plus delta t, iteration i minus 1, this i minus 1 corresponds to that i minus 1. We know this value, of course, minus the creep strain calculated based on the stress at the end of iteration k minus 1. That one goes right in here. It goes in there as well. And therefore, these are the creep strains corresponding to the end of iteration k minus 1. We calculate this right hand side and obtain an updated value of stress corresponding to iteration k. This is the iteration that has to be performed at every one of the integration points in the finite element mesh. Here we show a nine node element with three by three integration. So this is a kind of iteration that has to be performed at every one of these integration point stations. When alpha is greater or equal to 1 half, we obtain a stable integration algorithm. This is a statement arrived at from a linearized stability analysis, though. And in practice, we use frequently uh, alpha equal to 1. Also, to accelerate this iteration at the integration point level, it is frequently effective to use some form of newton raphson iteration. The choice of the time step using the impl implicit integration scheme is now governed by considerations, by two considerations. The first one, of course, you want to converge in the equilibrium, in that iteration, in that iteration which had the iteration counter k minus 1 to k. We want to converge in there. And of course, also, even if we do converge, we want to have an accurate uh, integration. Our errors in the, in the integration should not be too large. Of course, we can also use some form of sub-incrementation, the way we have been discussing it when we talked in the last lecture about plasticity. Uh, if we compare time steps that are usable, that are realistically usable with the implicit scheme, with alpha greater or equal to 1 half, with the time steps that we are bound to use when we use alpha equal to 0, because we need to have there a time step small enough to have stability of the integration, we find that with alpha greater or equal to 1 half, we can use usually, frequently, much larger time steps. But not always. Uh, we will see later on an example where alpha equals 0 performs just as well as the scheme of alpha equal to 1 half. If we deal with thermoplasticity and creep, we have to model the plastic strain components. And here we have uh, schematically shown how we can model those strain components. Notice four different temperatures 
for different temperature levels, we have uh, different stress strain laws. In each case, we have assumed a bilinear assumption. Notice that the yield stress drops down as the temperature increases, of course. And with increasing temperature, our creep curves show, uh, look this way. Notice that our creep strain, of course, increases at a given stress when the temperature increases. To evaluate the stresses in thermoplastic and creep analysis, we use this equation here. Notice elastic stress strain law. Of course, now changing with time, with temperature, that is. And uh, here we have the elastic differential strain increment. Thermal strains also enter now here as well. Creep strains, plastic strains, total differential strain increment. If we use the alpha method, the, this integration without sub-incrementation, uh, or say a sub-increment of 1, going from t to, delta, to t plus delta t in one step, uh, we would have that this equation reduces directly to that equation. Notice this is here now the stress strain law at time t plus delta t. Temperature corresponding to that time would go in here. And here we have the st total strain increment from time t to t plus delta t. We subtract the plastic strain increment over that time increment, the creep strain increment over that time increment, and similarly the thermal strain increment. And these are here the corresponding quantities, total strain, plastic strain, creep strain, thermal strains, corresponding to time t. Notice that EP and EC and E thermal have to be evaluated in this integration, and we evaluate them as shown here. Notice here t plus alpha delta t sigma goes in, and if alpha is equal to greater greater equal one half, typically we would use alpha one half or alpha equals one for an implicit integration. We need again to iterate at each integration point to satisfy the uh, stress strain equation. Of course, t alpha is a coefficient of thermal expansion at time t. Please don't confuse this value with the alpha integration parameter that we talked about earlier. The final iterative equation, if we use uh, alpha greater or equal to 1 half, we would find, looks this way, stress strain law at time t plus delta t, elastic stress strain law, I should say, goes in here. And on the right-hand side, we have the total strain corresponding to time t plus delta t iteration i minus 1, end of iteration i minus 1, plastic strains, creep strains, thermal strains, which are given corresponding to time t. For, and we subtract here the plastic strain increment, the creep strain increment, both based on the stress at the end of iteration k minus 1, and of course the thermal strain increment. So this is the equation that we would solve at each integration point, at each integration point in the finite element mesh by iterating until convergence is reached. Until, in other words, this stress here is basically equal to that stress. And as I pointed out earlier, we really need to use some form of newton raphson iteration in order to accelerate uh, this iteration when delta t is uh, uh, not, un unless delta t is very, very small. Of course, we can also use sub-incrementation, and uh, then the convergence will be increased because our delta, our time step over the sub-increment is smaller. But I should also mention, uh, as I did already earlier, it is very effective frequently to use this new algorithm, the effective stress function algorithm, to solve basically this equation. And please look at the reference given in the study guide if you're interested in reading up about that method. Let's look now at some example solutions. And the first problem that I'd like to discuss with you is a very simple problem of a bar under a uniaxial stress sigma. The creep law that we want to use is given here. Uh, the stress is measured in uh, megapascal time in hours, and E and nu 
The elasticity constants are given down here. Uh, what we want to do here is to look at various solutions that have been obtained with alpha equals 0. We know we don't use sub-incrementation. Uh, alpha equals 1. The effective stress function procedure was used here. In all cases, we assume an MNO formulation, or we use an MNO formulation, and uh, we use full Newton iterations without line searches with these tolerances, and we discuss the meaning of these tolerances in an earlier lecture. In the response predictions for which we used the ADENA program, of course, you will be seeing the elastic strains plus the creep strains. Let's first look at the response when we put a constant load of 100 MPa onto the specimen when the material law is, the creep material law is shown here, or with this material creep law. Notice that displacements are measured upwards, time measured horizontally here, and the time step that we used in this particular case was 10 hours with alpha equal to 1. So this is the creeps, the total strain accumulation, but measured in terms of displacement. Of course, the bar is 5 meters long, so you could directly obtain the strain by simply taking this displacement divided by 5. If we increase the stress from 100 MPa to 200 MPa, you obtain this response curve for the displacement at the right end of the bar. We use again the alpha equals 1 parameter with the effective stress function algorithm and a time step of 10 hours. In this particular case, we had a change from 100 MPa to 200 MPa and in the applied stress. And that is modeled as shown on this view graph, constant stress up to time 500 hours, and then the stress increment taken over 10 hours. And then the stress is constant at 200 MPa. Stress reversal from 100 MPa to minus 100 MPa gives this response. Notice we are not crossing exactly at that point because of elastic strains. A constant load of 100 MPa, but now with a different exponent on the time gave for the creep law, gives this response, delta t 10 hours, alpha equals 1 still. If we increase the stress from 100 to 200 MPa with this new creep law, or new exponent, I should say, we get this response for the displacement at the right end of the bar. And finally, the stress reversal from 100 to minus 100 MPa gives this response. Notice we have here, of course, a strain or a displacement at the end of the bar due to the elastic effects. Let's consider now the use of alpha equals 0 for the stress increase from 100 MPa to 200 MPa problem. Uh, and see how our alpha equals 0 solution performs when compared to alpha equals 1. You can see that with delta t equals 10 hours, we get a response that is very much the same, or very, the two responses calculated with alpha equals 0 and alpha equals 1 are very close to each other. If we use a larger time step, delta t equals 50 hours, both algorithms converge, but the solution becomes less accurate with alpha equals 0 in this particular problem, in this particular problem. Notice our baseline solution that we are comparing with here is alpha e corresponds to alpha equals 1 and delta t equals 10, which is a solid line. When we take an even larger time step, delta t equals 100 hours, we find that alpha equals 0 does not converge anymore at t equals 600 hours, whereas alpha, whereas the, as the use of alpha equals 1 gives still very good results. Alpha equals 1 gives these triangles here, and they lie exactly on the response obtained with alpha equals 1 delta t equals 10 hours. So 
excellent results with alpha equals 1, even when the time step is 10 times larger. With alpha equals 0, we could only obtain this, the response up to this point, and then we did not converge anymore in the solution. This was a very simple problem, but a demonstrative problem. Uh, let us look at another problem now, another example, that has a bit more complexity, uh, and I think that you also will enjoy looking at. Here we have a column subjected to a compressive load R, which is not applied exactly at the center of the column, but is applied with an offset. Uh, we analyze this column as a plane stress problem. The material constants, elastic material constants, are given here in elastic buckling load, calculated using uh, analytical formulas. The Euler buckling load is given here as 4,100 kilonewton. The goal of the analysis is to determine the collapse response using different material assumptions. First of all, is using an elastic material assumption, then assuming elastoplasticity, and finally assuming creep in the material. We use in each case a total Lagrangian formulation. If you were to try to use a materially nonlinear only formulation for this problem, of course, you would never predict the actual collapse of the column. You have to include large displacement, large rotation effects, although the assumption of small strain is quite reasonable even for this problem. The solution procedure that we use will be the full Newton method without line searches. And these are the tolerance values that we're using, which we discussed already earlier in an earlier lecture. The mesh used is a 10 8-node quadrilateral element mesh. Here you see the 8-node elements, 10 of them. We don't show the nodes, but for each of these elements, uh, we use also 3 by 3 Gauss integration. So notice through the thickness of the total column, we would have six integration point stations. First, we predict the elastic response. And in that elastic response, using the total Lagrangian formulation, we enter with this stress-strain law. Second pillar Kirchhoff stresses are related to the Green-Lagrange strains via the elasticity constants. And we discussed this stress-strain law quite a bit in an earlier lecture. The response predicted is shown here. Applied force in kilo newton, and here the lateral displacement at the, of the top of the column. Notice the Euler buckling load calculated from classical analysis is shown by the blue line here, and our analysis yields this response. If we perform the elastoplastic analysis with a strain hardening modulus equal to 0, in other words, we assume perfect plasticity, a yield stress of 3,000 kilopascal, and we use the von Mises yield criterion. In this formula, we would predict with this formula here quite adequately the large displacement elastic plastic uh, response. And of course, this will be for this column, the large displacement collapse response. Notice that CEP0 is the incremental elastoplastic constitutive matrix calculated the way we discussed it in the previous lecture, but instead of using the engineering stresses, we enter now with uh, the components of the second pillar Kirchhoff stress, right in there. The plastic buckling that is calculated using uh, this approach is shown here. Notice this is the elastoplastic response curve, applied force, lateral displacement at the top of the column. The elastic response curve is shown here. Finally, we want to calculate the creep response. And for this analysis, we have to select a creep law. This is the creep law that we selected, uh, a power creep law with the exponent up here equal to 1. On the time, in other words, of exponent from 1. Notice that we are entering here, of course, with effective quantities, effective creep strains, effective stresses, the way I discussed it earlier. 
we do not include in this analysis plasticity effects. We apply in this particular analysis a load, a constant load of 2,000 kilonewton to the column and simply watch what happens to the columns. Due to the creep strains, the displacements of the columns will increase, will increase, uh, and we want to measure, calculate the increase of the column displacement, and we say that the column has collapsed. This is, of course, somewhat arbitrary, but we say that it has collapsed when the lateral displacement at the top of the column is 2 meters. This corresponds, by the way, to a strain of about 2% at the base of the column. And we know that our uh, total Lagrangian formulation is quite applicable up to that percentage range. We want to investigate uh, varying time steps and varying alpha. Alpha equals 0 is the Euler forward method, and alpha equals 0.5 and 1 corresponds, of course, to an implicit integration scheme. If we do so, we obtain the collapse times given in this table. Using delta t equals 0.5, with alpha equals 0, we get 100. With alpha equals 0.5, we get also 100. And with alpha equals 1, we get 98.5. So the collapse time predicted with delta t equals 0.5 is very close using any one of these integration schemes. When the time step gets larger, the collapse time changes for alpha equals 0, for alpha 0.5, and for alpha 1. In fact, the difference between these collapse times for delta t equals 0.5 is quite a bit here, showing that this time step is uh, a bit large for this analysis. The column looks this way pictorially. At time one hour, the creep effects are still negligible. At time 50 hours, well, there we have some creep effects already. And at 100 hours, collapse occurs of the column. In other words, the column displacement being uh, two meters or larger at the top. In this particular analysis, we use delta t equals 0.5 hours and alpha equals 1 half. If we compare once more the different responses predicted, we find that with delta t equals 0.5 hours, the lateral displacement as a function of time predicted using alpha 1, alpha 0, alpha equals 0.5 uh, is shown as given here by these curves. And notice these curves are very close to each other. If we use a, the large time step, delta t equals 5 hours, we can see here that alpha equals 0, the alpha equals 0 curve is very close to the alpha equals 0.5 curve, whereas the alpha equals 1 curve is quite a bit away. So in this particular case, we really have a much larger error accumulation when we use alpha equals 1 than we have with alpha equals 0.5 or alpha equals 0. We conclude then for this problem that as the time step is reduced, uh, the uh, collapse times predicted using alpha equals 0, alpha 1 half, and alpha 1 are very, very close to each other. In fact, for delta t equals to 0.5, the difference in the collapse times is less than two hours using the three integration schemes. And we also notice that for a reasonable time step uh, in this particular problem, we certainly did not encounter any solution instabilities, particularly with respect to the alpha equals 0 technique integration method, where one might have instabilities, as I pointed out earlier. For this problem, we did not encounter any such instabilities. This concludes then what I wanted to share with you in terms of experiences as documented on the view graphs. I'd like to now share some further experiences with you regarding an interesting analysis uh, that we performed some time ago uh, regarding a heat treatment process. And that analysis is documented on the slides. So let me walk over here and discuss 
these slides with you. Here we have a cylinder, and it is this cylinder that is subjected to a heat treatment process. Uh, namely, initially the cylinder is at 900 degrees Celsius, and it suddenly cooled down to 20 degrees Celsius. The objective of the analysis was, first of all, to predict the temperature distributions in the cylinder as a function of time as the cylinder cools down, and then to predict the corresponding stresses in the cylinder, and most importantly, to predict the final, the residual stresses. Here, once again, the cylinder. Here, the finite element model. Notice that we modeled one typical section through the cylinder, and that section is shown here. The center line of the cylinder is here, and we perform an axisymmetric analysis. Notice that we have a higher density of elements at the outer face, or near the outer face of the cylinder, than at the inside of the cylinder. cylinder because we are predicting higher temperature gradients, stress gradients, at this end. Notice that in this particular analysis, we constrained the top face to move just vertically up to basically remain a straight line. That was achieved using constrained equations. Of course, all these nodes along the top face can move over. The assumption of this top face to move only vertically up is due to the fact that the cylinder, or reflects the fact that the cylinder is, a, is assumed to be infinitely long. The next uh, slide now shows the material properties used for the temperature analysis. Here we have the heat capacity as a function of temperature, and here we have the conductivity as a function of temperature. This data was entered in the heat transfer analysis in which we wanted to predict the temperatures. These uh, material properties here, Young's modulus, strain hardening modulus, Poisson ratio, are entered in the stress analysis. Notice the large variation in ET, Poisson ratio, and E as a function of time over the range from 0 degrees Celsius to 900 degrees Celsius. Next we see the variation of the yield stress as a function of time. Notice very marked variation. And notice this here is a region of a phase change where we have a tremendous drop in the yield stress. The next slide now shows the coefficient of thermal expansion as a function of temperature. Notice that the coefficient is positive in this regime and that regime, and is negative here to take into account the phase change effects. On the next slide now, we see the prediction of the temperatures as calculated. Notice, initially, the whole cylinder is at 900 degrees Celsius. We measure here the axis along the axis of the cylinder, and here temperature. And as time progresses, the temperature changes down to 20 degrees Celsius at 300 seconds. Let's look a little bit more closely here. Notice at 0.05 seconds, this here is the temperature distribution in the cylinder. At 0.5 seconds, this is the temperature distribution in the cylinder. And at 3.5 seconds, we see this temperature distribution. At 18.5 seconds, we see this temperature distribution. Notice the large temperature gradients right here in this area. And this is the area where we had a denser finite element mesh, then close to the center line of the cylinder. The next slide now shows the temperatures as a function of time, here time, here temperature, at a number of locations. First of all, at the axis of the cylinder. And notice there we have a calculated curve, the solid curve, 
and the measured curve, the dashed curve. They are remarkably close to each other. This is here the calculated temperature at element 14 within the cylinder. And this is here the surface temperature. Calculated because there we did not have any measurement. The only measurement that we had to compare with was the temperature at the axis of the cylinder. Notice that at 300 degrees, at 300 seconds, at 300 seconds, the axis as well as the surface, all basically all points in the cylinder have reached 20 degrees Celsius. The next slide now shows the results obtained in the laboratory regarding the residual stress field. Here we see as a function of the radius through the cylinder, the residual stresses, circumferential stress, sigma phi phi, uh, longitudinal stress, sigma zz, and radial stress, sigma rr, once again as obtained in the laboratory. We wanted to compare our calculated results obtained with the fine element solution with these laboratory results. And the next slide shows the results obtained in the fine element analysis, sigma phi phi, sigma zz, and sigma rr. And if you compare these results with the results obtained in the laboratory, you see a very close correspondence. In fact, an excellent correspondence for this very complex problem that is considered here. Notice that we are uh, making various assumptions on the material model level, in other words, a bilinear material assumption, etc., etc., for this uh, analysis. Uh, if you are interested in the details, please refer to the paper in which we are describing this analysis in much more depth and the references given in the study guide. This then brings me to the end of what I wanted to discuss with you uh, in this lecture. And before closing, I like to, or at closing, I like to uh, really mention to you that we have in these two lectures in which we discussed elastoplasticity and creep response as modeled in fine element analysis, we have in these two lectures really covered only quite a bit of the material that is worthwhile looking at and studying and getting familiar with. The elastoplasticity and creep response of structures is, of course, a very large field, and we have just taken two lectures to cover some of the aspects as we use them in finite element analysis. There is a lot more we could talk about. But thank you for your attention.